Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am back here. It is, uh, what's, what is it? August, August 9th already. This year is motoring by, I've got a guest from Akron, Ohio, by the name of John Davis. And John, I was watching your videos last night. I'm fascinated by your, your, your act on stage, the whips, the nun, nunchucks. I, I think it's unbelievable. So we, I hope we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, but, but for those of you who don't know John, He's a stuntman, he's a podcaster, he's an author, and he's a motivational speaker. And uh, we met through a site uh, called Podmatch, which has been really, really good to both of us. So John, uh, John and I today are going to talk about hacking the fight or flight response. And I appreciate you being here, John. Thanks for, uh, thanks for spending some time with me this morning. Oh, you're quite welcome. I'm really excited. I, I, I have my cup of coffee so I can survive the morning. <laughs> okay. Well, you're going to need it. <laughs> you're going to need it. So there's so many things that we could cover. Uh, this whole fight or flight thing, uh, that's that whole amygdala response. But before we get into all of that, uh, I know you've got a pretty colorful background. I know that you suffered, uh, uh, you had an accident years ago where you were paralyzed, and I know you overcame that. But what I'm most interested in it is how, how did you end up doing what you do today, and, and how did that experience impact you? Well, it, it, it's a great question, and it's a great lead-in, because uh, without that accident, I would not be doing what I'm doing today. That accident was, was, a, was the worst moment of my life and the best moment of my life. When I was uh, when I was in my early 20s, 2021, 20, I was well on the way to becoming a stuntman and a fight director. I was working with a couple of the top fight directors in the country. Uh, I was well on the way to get my black belt in Taekwondo, and I was very healthy, very fit, very strong. And a buddy of mine said, hey, can you come over to my house and help me unload my van? Which, you know, first of all, you have to question his friendship for asking me to come help him unload his van. <laughs> but second of all, um, I drove out to his house. He was a professional potter. And... Uh, Potter. And he had potter. He, he made pottery. Oh, pottery. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His van was filled with 80 pound boxes of clay. Okay. And so I climbed up in, the, in that van. And I, to me, at that point in my life, I was very much into my physical fitness. And because of what I was doing for my career, you know, I got to be very physically fit to do that job. Right. And so this to me was just one more workout. I felt really great about the idea about going and lifting 80 pound boxes of clay out of a van because it was another workout. So I climbed up in that van, I picked up the very first box, and I turned to set it outside of the van, and my spine split in two. They hauled me to the hospital, couldn't move. Doctors said, told me I was paralyzed and weren't sure whether I was ever able to walk again, that I would never have a physical career. They informed me that day I had a condition known as spina bifida occulta, which basically what that means is three of my vertebrae never formed properly at birth. And when I twisted with the extra 80 pounds of weight, I basically disconnected the top half of my body from the lower half of my body. Well, when I was lying in that bed, someone gave me a book, and that book was The Tao Ji Kune Do by Bruce Lee. And in that book, which if anybody has ever read that book, it's the number one selling martial arts book on earth still to this day. Um, that book is an interesting book because it's not a, a, a method of martial arts. It's a philosophy of martial arts about staying very present, leveraging your present moment, and then also remaining mentally flexible and i decided that day that i was not going to take the beliefs and the ideas of the doctors or my family or anybody else and that i was i was going to be a stuntman i was going to be a fight director and i started focusing that day on taking my present moment and making it as successful as possible and getting overcoming my fear mm -hmm. uh, of never doing those things and by leveraging those moments and stacking them upon each other, I, within a year and a half, <laughs> stood on top of a three-story tower and jumped off into a fall pad. Uh, I was able to bring myself back from, from complete being, completely being paralyzed to, to actually being back as strong as I was before. And I went on to do over 4,000 live comedy sword fighting stunt shows all over the world, including on the front lines of, of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan on six USO tours. But without that accident, Without that that moment, I never would have been able to go forward and do the things that I do because that that showed me what I was capable of. That gave me the ability to go, okay, I can do this. I suddenly started to notice that I was enjoying the time off of the stage than I was on the stage more because what was happening is after the shows, I would sit down in the audience with people and I was helping them break out of their fear barriers and their self-limiting beliefs and I was helping them achieve their goals. And to me, that was that was much more impactful in my world to be able to take what I had learned from my experience and turn it into something more, more powerful. 
And but I still wanted to do whips and nunchucks and, <laughs> and swords. And, and I created the corporate action hero. And now I go into corporations and, and, and companies all over all over the world, and I awaken their teams interaction heroes, and I and I show them what they're capable of. And when I say I show them what they're capable of. I do multiple speeches. I talk about leadership and marketing and sales and all that stuff. But when I do my main corporate action hero speech, the last thing that happens on stage is I bring the most timid person I can find in their audience to the stage. And in under five minutes, that most timid person will learn to crack a whip and take targets out of my hand with it. You know, I saw you up on the stage with the nunchucks and I'm thinking, yeah. oh, he's not going to, he's not going to actually do it. You know, I thought you'd do like a couple <laughs> of twists. I'm like, Jesus, I mean, you really... <laughs> You're, you're like the real deal with this. You're not just like screwing around with this. Well, I've been, I've been swinging nunchucks for over 30 years. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, I had a little bit of practice on that one. <laughs> yeah, I was swinging, I was swinging nunchuck before the accident. <laughs> yeah. Well, the whips too, the whips too. So you, this is interesting because you were lying in bed reading this Bruce Lee book. And all of a sudden you've got this thought in your head that I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to accept this outcome. And right. I'm going to work through it. it. Was it simply the book or you pre-wired to be that way? I, I was very, very fortunate for, for a lot of reasons. My mother uh, had her master's degree in liturgy in the Catholic church. And I had been the altar boy and the, and the, you know, the kid who shoveled the snow at the church and the whole bit. And at 18, she said to me, John, she says, spirituality is a personal journey. You need to find what you truly believe. And she literally said, I hope you come back to Catholicism, but find what you truly believe. So I started studying. So by the time I was 22 and I had the accident, I had studied Buddhism and Hinduism and um, Islam. I'd studied Baha'i and all the new age writers and speakers. And I had really gone off and, and found the same thoughts in all of it. In my experience lying in that bed, I had to think, what, what are my thoughts? And then I, then I had the big realization that paralyzed or, or done working was not my thought. It was the doctor's thought. That, the interesting thing about that, that, that book by Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee wrote that book when he was in traction in a hospital and had just been told he'd never do martial arts again. When he couldn't do martial arts, he stayed focused on doing martial arts. And after that book and after that time in the hospital, he did every movie that we know him for. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now, so after the fact. After the fact, right. And so to, when I read that book, I didn't know that. I found that out later. And that's what happened with me. I, I took those same beliefs and er, all the big stunts and all the working with stars and all that stuff happened after the fact. It was happening. You know, I did 4,000 comedy sword fighting stunts. It was all over the world. Yeah. You know, after I, I was told I'd never be able to do sword fights or be a stuntman. Do, do you think had you not prioritized this? It was probably a hobby at one time, right? I mean, you, you, you had a hobby in order to get into martial arts or sword fighting or nunchucks or whatever so had you not perfected some sort of interest or skill would you be able to do what you're doing now i still practice nunchucks an hour a day i've been doing i've been doing it for you know 30 some years but not because i'm a quote-unquote master but because i love to improv and improvise and i think most people think of mastery as skills proficiency and mastery is not skills proficiency mastery is learning all that you can, and then adding to the skill. As far as stunt work, when I was a kid, my whole thing was to be a, a sword fighting kid. I had a stick in my hand all the time as a sword. I, I mean, my, my favorite movie when I was a little kid it was a movie well before my time. Errol Flynn's Robin Hood was my favorite movie, right? Which, on a weird note, years and years later, I ended up taking a couple of classes from a man named Patty Crane, who was Errol Flynn's stunt double. So I, you know, I had a chance to actually do that as well. But um, I got dragged to a Renaissance festival by a friend of mine. And I had had no real, real interest in that. But I went there and I, I it's, I'm going to add another little piece of mental sure. trauma that I think your audience will, will, will get. Sure. Um, like I said, I, I, I was raised in a big Catholic family. They had seven kids. And my father was, was an alcoholic abuser. And I was the one kid in the family he did not like. And so I got the brunt of everything from my father. And um, going to a Renaissance festival with this interest in sword fighting and meeting two of the top fight directors in the country at that Renaissance festival and having them look at me and go, hey, you've got talent as an actor and a combatant was the positive reinforcement that I needed 
to to break free of this the limiting beliefs and self-doubt I have for my father as well. Mm-hmm. So um, it's really an interesting. You know, there's we all have traumas in our lives, but the question is, are you are you living your life as a victim of your traumas, or are you living your life in a way where you're leveraging this moment to achieve something greater and becoming an action hero and not a reaction zero? So a lot of the people I know, successful people I know, John, you're 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 one of them based on your stories. You know when everybody has something that happens, whatever it is, some more severe than others. And I, you know, doing the work I do, and I'm sure you experience this as well. You, I encounter a lot of people who have been through some crazy stuff, whether it's loss of a child or, or you know, some sudden death or, or whatever. And um, the, the strong, well, the, the ones that are succeeding now are the ones that took that experience, faced it, and somehow work through it, but they often have something else that holds them up. I'm wondering, you know, as you grew up with your, you, the situation with your dad was, was going down this path of martial arts or sword fighting, kind of your, your escape and, and, and indirectly, were you developing something that would ultimately serve you later versus say turning to drugs or alcohol or, or being an abuser yourself? Let me, let me put it this way. I believe that, that addiction in any form is is medicating your fear yeah that you're, you're medicating your fears and for me the the what i i would say i became addicted to was the positive reinforcement that i got well let me let me put let me do it this way i mean let me back into this just a little bit fear what is fear fear is an emotional reaction to some future event that may or may not happen with you focused on a negative outcome fear is just negatively focused on certainty but on top of that fear is a feeling right? And it's a negative feeling. To break out of our fears, the people who are trained to break out of fear, to give you an example, actors on Broadway, they walk on stage, they have a thousand people in front of them, they forget their lines. They have, first, they have a giant fear response, right? What are they trained to do? They're trained to exhale, relax all their muscles, and all of their, all of their lines rush back into their head. Why? Because when you're in a fear response, we, we, have a natural primal reaction that makes us go <gasps> and gasp for air. You know, people when they're in fear feel like they can't breathe. It's not because they can't breathe. It's because their body is full of air so that they can run further and faster. The the fear responses that I had were from my father were came from the idea that I was not worthy. I was not loved. I was not this, right? And when these guys came along and said, not only are you worthy, you're talented. Right. I, I actually had one of those fight directors say to me, he says, I see a lot of talent in you as an actor and a combatant, and I want to be part of that growth. Can I, can I offer you my training for free? The concept of, of the people who succeed the most are the ones who, who latch onto the things that are positive rather than the things that are negative. I said, when you look at a, back to addiction again, when you look at somebody who smokes, for instance, they're addicted to cigarettes. The first thing they do is they, they go, they grab their cigarette, they light it up. <sighs> and they allow themselves to exhale, yeah. right? Then you get an alcoholic, he gets his beer. This is coffee, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> this is my other addiction. <laughs> and the guy with the, with his, all day long, he's been stressed out and he gets his beer and he, <sighs> and he allows himself to exhale, yeah. right? Yeah. Here I am. I'm, I'm a guy who loves pizza. And I was a pizza holic, right? Yeah. I get my first slice of pizza. Oh, God, that's so good, right? <laughs> yeah. We allow ourselves to exhale. We allow ourselves to get that feeling. Yeah of the lack of fear. Yeah. And so uh, that was a very powerful thing for me because I was terrified I was never going to get out of that bed because I had this I'm going to be I'm going to be the 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 kid that wasn't worthy. I believe you learn from your traumas but you don't live in your traumas. Right. But you you had an interest in something and I think there's a lot you probably didn't even realize it at the time, you know, and right. and uh you know, I, I was thinking about as as you were talking um and I'm now, now you, you said like three things that I wanted to comment on and I'm, now I'm going to lose my train of thought here, but you know, it, it, you had to, at some level, believe that guy on the stage who said you were talented. If you didn't come from that environment where you maybe lack trust, say in your dad, in that moment, was there ever a part of you that said, are you serious? Like, you think I'm good? Like, did you not believe it or did you oh. immediately believe it? Well, it's, it's a, it's a, that's a question I've never been asked before. That's an actually really interesting question because what happened at, at that Renaissance, it was a Renaissance festival. So think, think about that. First of all, it was a fantasy place. 
So I had I had literally left the real world and was in a fantasy place, right? <laughs> Surrounded by people. And and I was getting a lot of positive reinforcement for my acting as well, because I I I had separated my person who couldn't go in front of people because I was I was profoundly shy as a child. I was, I mean, I was an introvert yeah. because of my experiences with my father. Yeah. When I went to a Renaissance festival and got brought into a Renaissance festival to work. I suddenly became a street character, which means I had to talk to thousands of people a day one on one. And and that was that's huge. Right. And I had I had created this character which allowed me to talk to those people. So I was able to separate my my broken child and make this creative, fun character. I mean, the first character I played was Darian the Barbarian, which, (laughs) you know, and the second character I played was Sir Cyril the Chicken Hearted. Right. So I had I had these crazy funny characters but they allowed me to explore my own my own um bravery you know as you as you're talking i i had a different childhood some some similar some similar but i remember like just being a young kid and we didn't get a lot of positive reinforcement at home mostly insults mostly what was wrong or you didn't you know god forbid you had braces that was where the attack came, you know, or, or if you were overweight, that's where the attack came at home. And so outside the home, when I would hear a compliment early on, I didn't believe it. That's the reason right. I asked the question. I didn't believe it. I'm like, are you kidding? Are you, are you mocking me? Was my initial. No, no, that, make, that makes perfect sense because the people who were supposed to give you unconditional love right. were, were telling you exactly what you are. And so that's the belief you took. Right. Exactly. Right. right. Makes, makes perfect sense. Right. The, the interesting thing about that is that. And it took me, took me years to figure this out. You know, we, don't, we only live in one moment. Yeah. We only live in the present moment. Your yeah. past is simply a stack of present moment memories. Yeah. And your future is just a place where you set goals for the next present moment. Yeah. But there's only one active moment that you can have thought, word, and deed. Yeah. And that's your present moment. So when I look at my past and I go, okay, what, what is that? Those were experiences I had. Do I want the same? Now, here's the interesting thing about the subconscious mind. It has two jobs. One, store those memories to create underlying subconscious belief. And two, to show you what you're focused on. And so if I, you know, I'm a person, I love Jeeps. So I, <laughs> I drive down the road. I see every Jeep on the road. I've, I've owned six of them. I have one in my garage right now. Right? And all you I Jeep love- people wave to each other. This like all you- yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. And over the years, it's morphed. It's no longer really just a wave now it's actually a peace symbol okay, okay that's nice <laughs> so it's nice yeah so um but yeah i see every jeep on the road i see every jeep parked at next to every house i because my conscious mind thinks jeep yep. so i see jeeps yep. you know if you've ever bought a car and you chose what kind of car you wanted you started seeing that kind of car before you went to the store to buy it all the time because that's what your subconscious mind does now here's the problem that people have they focus negatively because of their underlying, underlying experience from their past, their victimhood, which makes their subconscious mind show them more negative, which creates a never-ending treadmill of negativity, which is why negative people always have something to be negative about. And positive people, the same thing. They always have something to be positive about. So the only way you break that cycle is to <laughs> do what they would say in Christianity, be born again. And I don't mean a born again Christian. I mean, set down your past. Start choosing consciously to, to, to have a present moment that's positive yeah. and just actively take these small moments, make them successful and positive and start stacking them into your subconscious belief until you change the underlying belief. The cool part about it is, is when you choose to consciously focus positive, it will start to show you positive. Yeah. And so this becomes very easy to change. It's only the first few steps that make it hard, right? The other yeah. thing is, is they sit in this moment and they look at that future and they think, God, that's so daunting. I want to get to that place, but that place will never magically appear in your present moment. Yeah. And that, and you will never get to that place because it's, it's up there. It's in the future. You will never go to the store next Thursday right now. Right. You know, what you have to realize is that by stacking these small present moment successes that are in alignment with that goal, that goal is coming to you mm-hmm. dependent on what you do in the here and now, you know, when that doctor said you can't, and I chose that I, I could, you know, and Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Yeah. Um, I started focusing on the, my neck muscles, not my injury, my neck muscles. Right. And I slowly started flexing my muscles 
down my back. And before day 30 was up, I was sitting up on the edge of a bed. Wow. Right. And at six months, I was walking around at a year. I was back to what I would consider a normal physicality, but not back to my rock hard masculine self. Oh, you look good. You look good. <laughs> back in, well, yeah. Back in the day, I had Fabio hair as opposed to this Telly Savalas thing I got going on right now. <laughs> you know, and I, I was a, but, um, but by the year and six months, year and six months, I was back to my physical, physical self. I was as strong as I ever was. I was doing martial arts. I was doing everything I ever wanted to do. But it was all about taking those, those moments and leveraging that flexing of those muscles moment at a time and stacking present moment positive. There's so, many, is, things, there's so many things I want to ask you. I, 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 like, I, and I, I don't want to derail this, but there's so many things I want to ask you. Um, it, what's running through my mind right now is you talk about this consciousness, but in order for any of that to happen, you actually have to be conscious. You have to be aware that that whole letting the breath out you've got to get to that point because a lot of folks when they are in that state of negativity it's a lifetime of unconscious habit that mm -hmm. they don't even realize is optional like my unconscious habit for example is when i'm out in traffic i rant and rave and yell at everyone and i don't even know i'm doing it and and until until my wife gets <laughs> in the car or my kids get in the car and inevitably, my daughter will say, Dad, that guy's window is open. I'm like, what? And like, but I'm not even <coughs> conscious of it. I, it's so funny you say, it. Well, this is perfect timing. <laughs> I, lit I literally, this morning, recorded and put out a video on my daily blog called um, uh, Blind Empathy. And the whole, a big portion of that video is all about driving down. The road. It, was, it, was, it starts with a George Carlin quote about how People who are faster than you are, are, are maniacs and the people who are slower than you are morons. And it's all about how we talk to the people around us, right? And, and it's really kind of an interesting thing because you being angry at that moment didn't harm them at all. Right. It only harmed you. It was only right. your moment that you, you made unsuccessful, yep. right? Yep. And, and the interesting thing is I discovered years and years and years ago that if I would drive down the road and somebody would zip by me real fast driving like a maniac, my, my, I had shifted my mind to such a point where I was able to go, oh God, I feel sorry for them because they're so stressed out that they got to feel like they're going to drive that way. Yep. Right. And then the people who are driving ultimately slow, you, know, you pass them and it's usually an old person. Yep. Right. Yep. And they're terrified of driving. Right. Right. And so that they're, they're driving slow to be, to be safe. Yes. Good. God bless them. You know? Yes. So it becomes a very different perspective. I found that when I was stressed out in my own life, is when I started lashing out at others when I drove. hundred uh, percent. You know, it's so funny you say that, especially as I get older with these glasses, for example, <laughs> yeah. I'm becoming more tolerant of <clears throat> slow driver. My wife and I went on a, a little uh, hour and a half ride the other day. And I'm, I, I don't like being out I, because I don't have the same, uh, you know, my reaction time visually is not the same. And I don't enjoy when somebody like speeds up and cuts me off but I'm more empathetic to the slower driver. I don't want to derail right. you with the driving conversation, but. No, I, I, want to, I want to add add to that driving story because it is important. What we're talking about ties completely into this. Okay. I, I coached a lady who was agoraphobic. She could never leave her house. Yeah. Terrified. Yeah. After coaching her for two years, she took a solo trip to Africa, climbed mountains and hung out with gorillas. Wow. Right now. Now that's crazy. Right. Yeah. But one of the pivotal moments that for her was we went to lunch one day. We we're dry. I was driving. I was driving down the road and I heard this little quiet, meek voice say to me, um, how come cars merge with you easily? And my response to her seems very esoteric, but my response was because I love driving. Yeah. Your outer experience yeah. is based upon your perception of it. Yeah. And so when you, when you're, when you are putting out a positive, I love to drive. So people give me reasons to love to drive. The subconscious mind shows that to me. And so the hacking the fight or flight response really comes down to several things. Number one, changing your belief about your present moment. But before that, even you have to recognize it, that you're in a fear. Right. Right. And because, and, and, and it's interesting. I say it that way in fear, people put themselves inside of something. And when you're inside of something, you can't steer it. You can't turn it. Yeah. So the first thing you have to do is realize that if that you're in fear and the easiest way to do that, are you positive or are you negative? Yeah. If you're negative, you're in fear period yeah right so if you're in a negative state of mind and you can just say 
oh, it's fear. Now you've, you've, you've compartmentalized it, you've labeled it, and you're no longer in it. How right? many people decide that that's what they are? I know you can't give me a number on that, but where they just say, this is who I am, <clears throat> they identify with it. The majority of the people in the world. And, and I believe that they're living in what, what I call the velvet cage. They're, they're, they're in their fears, they understand where their fears come from, and they're afraid to shake it up because they don't want to create new fears. So they don't open the door and they don't fly. And if the interesting thing is life is life is subjective, right? It's it's a it's an experience rather than a than a concrete truth. Yeah. Everything changes. You can take take this moment and become somebody new. I have done it multiple times. I was a stuntman, a fight director, an artistic director of theme parks, a college professor, and I and now I'm a keynote speaker. Yeah. All right. Now all of those things are not necessarily <laughs> connect to each other, right. but I chose what I wanted to do. And I changed my life experience yeah. a, a, along the way. Many times you can, you literally can become whatever you want at any given point of your life. It's just a matter of you choosing to do it. Um, and th that's the interesting thing is it's the choice. Once you, to break out of that, out of that past negative cycle, you've got to break out of your fears. And the first thing you do is recognize it as fear. And then, and then exhale, you know, get that moment where you, I was on the front lines of Iraq and Afghanistan and I was talking to soldiers. I said, today, you're going to go out there and you know, you're going someplace that you're probably going to get shot at, or maybe bombs blown up. How can you do that? And the guy says, well, the first thing we do is we all get together. We go, okay, <sighs> okay, we're doing this thing. And they exhale. Yep. They literally do that. Yep. Second thing they do is they get focused on a positive outcome of their objective, yep. right? So if, if we break into my five Fs to get fearlessly focused, right? So now they're fearlessly focused. They got, a, they got something positive to focus on. Mm -hmm. And because they stay positively focused, they achieve the goal of being of a positive outcome. That's, that's you know, and the, the military, I've spoken to the military all over the world. Right. And it's when you listen, when you look at their training, that's what they're trained to do. You know, they talk about um, the American military, the most, the most amazing strongest fighting force in the world you know that that's a belief and they instill that belief in the soldiers right. because they we are we're, we're america you know that's that's that pride right that's a part of that belief is you know no we're america we got this right, right. and you know good or bad we got you know whatever believe about that but but, but focus on this real quick so for the, the the focused outcome and we'll, we'll let's dive into the five f's here but yeah yeah you've got, you've got to believe the outcome is possible versus oh my god there's chaos out there so if you're going to go into battle you've got to face the fact that part of the deal is i'm going to get shot at i might actually get shot you have to you know it, it, and we still we're still going to be okay we're still going to achieve our goal versus oh my god Right. Well, you know, one of the, one of the things that I find when I when I discovered the five F's, I, I I discovered them naturally, and I discovered them naturally because I started seeing the pattern. And you just literally led me into the third F. <laughs> Let's hear it. Yeah. Okay. Faith, belief. Right. You get fearlessly focused. You get you you, you fearlessly focus on a goal. Then you got to believe it. You got to put faith behind it. That's where that's right where you were leading me, right? That's right where the conversation was going. So you get it's a natural natural transition. Fearlessly focus with faith. That belief is is imperative. Now, when I was a a young father, my father, my kid was six years old. He had a Nerf crossbow. We had a game we used to play where we we would shoot this Nerf crossbow across the living room and hit the side of a trash can in the kitchen and make a big noise. Nerf crossbows, by the way, the most effort, <laughs> accurate Nerf weapon in the world. I mean, after, after you said, you say you have one? I know I'm going to get one after you said Oh, that. my God. Oh, they're awesome. Awesome. And, uh, but we had this game and, and we could hit the trash can every time. So the game, we had to make it more difficult. So I would stand halfway between the kitchen and the, and the couch where my son was sitting with two Nerf swords, flailing them up and down. So he couldn't get the arrow through. Right. And then, then I'd get up to shoot and he'd flail them. And I, you know, I, and I'd shoot the wall and the floor and the ceiling and him and anything but the trash can. Cause my kid had to win. Sure. Yeah. This is six. About the fourth or fifth time, he starts laughing. I go, kind of, why are you laughing? He says, I know why you miss. I said, oh, crap. He caught me. I go, why? Why, why do you think I miss, kind He says, because you don't believe you're going to hit it. Wow. You got to believe you're going to hit it. You have to have the belief. Now, sometimes faith, you know, faith is simply trust. And sometimes you have to do things and start to see that positive reinforcement to have faith. 
So the next of the five Fs is follow through, right? You actually have to start stacking those present moments and start seeing the results of those positive moments. Which so, is really rebuilding a habit and a way of thinking. You've got to believe that the follow through is worth it, right? Again, right, right. Now, you, let, me, let, me, let me drop into something really kind of esoteric just for a second, if you don't mind. No, go. Okay, in, in Buddhism, the, one of the most famous Buddhist quotes out there is life is suffering. That, that was translated from the language of Pali and Pali is a, is a conceptual language. When you translate it to English, which is a literal language, they, they break the actual translation of the word dukkha, which was pain, into three separate translations. And so when we translate it to English, we take the first translation as the answer. So in English, it's pain, life is suffering. In Pali, it literally goes, life is suffering caused by our habitual responses from our subconscious mind. So it's, it comes down to, you got to get fearlessly focused with faith, follow through. And those follow throughs only happen when you decide that it's okay to take an action. Yeah. You, you've got to be the one who actually does those actions and takes, now, then the, the last of the five Fs is flexibility. And flexibility is the one that a lot of people get derailed by because what happens is they're, they're going for a goal. Something happens that doesn't seem like it's in alignment with the goal or is contrary to what they're trying to achieve and they give up they say oh well that's not going to happen now they choose to give up if you're subcon if you're truly consciously positively focused on the goal and your subconscious mind shows you something that seems like it could derail you your your subconscious mind is not showing that as an enemy trying to stop you it's showing you what needs to be addressed you have to stay focused on the goal and just start chipping away at the obstacle you know in bruce lee used to talk about be like water you, know, you flow around the rock or over the rock and, and in time through the rock. Water will wear down a rock. It literally comes down to the idea that you have to stay flexible in those moments and hold on to that outer picture. You know, hacking the fight or flight response, it always comes back to that first one, that fear response. Fear is always the one limiting factor that will stop you from achieving any goal. You bring a timid person on stage in front of a thousand people. What's their first fear? I don't want to get up. Never I don't, yeah. I'm in front of these people, right? right? Yeah. I'm going to look like an idiot, right? They come to the stage before they can think, do, or say anything. I give them a mission purpose. Thank you so much for coming up here and helping me. I really needed you, know, you to help me. And I put them on purpose of helping yep. service, you know, an action, action means create motion, start momentum or to do something. A hero is someone who achieves extraordinary results in service of someone. Right. So I put them in service. So I put her in service. Next thing I do is I, before she can think anything, I turn to the audience and I say, isn't she a rock star? And the audience cheers for her, yeah. right? So I, I instantly negated the fear that they're not going to like her. I preloaded that they already do. So then I start talking about fishing. I don't talk about anything else. I talk about, talk about fishing. So I say, today I'm going to teach you how to, how, how to uh, cast a fishing rod effectively. And I hand her a whip. Before she can think anything, I say, we're using this as a fishing rod because it's the same motion. So don't worry about, don't worry about what it is. Only worry about fishing. You hand somebody a whip, they think pain, they think danger. Some of them think frisky Friday night. Before she can get deeper into the idea that she's got a whip in her hand, I turn to the section of the audience that she's, that she's pointed at. And I say, you guys, everyone take your hands, put them underneath your chin, make a guppy face, doing something weirder than her. Right. Choose which fish you want to catch and cast your fishing rod. And she cracks the whip. And it cracks loud. Kaboom, right? I said, catch another fish. Kaboom. Catch another fish. Boom, right? Never talk about whips once. Then I go over and I pull out a target. Now, she earlier on in the speech has seen me crack a target out of somebody else's hand. I look at her and I said, did you hear it crack? She says, yes. Right? So now here's where the neurolinguistics kicks in. I have anchored success to the sound of a whip cracking. I'm literally dropping into her head that she already knows. I'm changing her timeline from learning a skill to knowledge of a skill yep. by shifting her mindset. I, I now have her out of that timeline. I said, all I want you to do now is look right here and cast your fishing rod. Well, what's her new fear? Her new fear that we're, we're and this is the whole point of this telling you the story, is showing you how fear constantly comes up and how I'm constantly managing the fear in this process. So what's her new fear? Her new fear is hitting me. Yeah, right. So bef before she can say anything, I say, here's something else. I promise 
you're not going to hurt me. You know, sometimes when you're, you're leading somebody through somebody stressful, you got to lie to them. <laughs> That's a pure lie. Okay. <laughs> she could totally take off my finger, man. <laughs> right. right, right. Uh, but the thing is, as, as, uh, as someone who's leading and someone who's guiding, yeah. my job is to be empathetic and meet them where they are. Yeah. I'm a leader, not a dragger. I'm not trying to drag her somewhere. I'm trying to meet her and guide her. Right. So I'm meeting her where she is and guiding her where I want her to be. I said, all I want you to do is look right here. Just cast your fishing rod. I still haven't talked about whips. And she casts the fishing rod and she hits the target. Anybody can achieve anything in their life as long as they're willing to recognize their fear, label it, exhale it out, get focused on a positive, uh, positive direction, and then also recognize when another fear crops, prop, crops up that you have to deal with that as well. Right. And, and, and dealing with it as simple as going <sighs> and exhaling yeah. and letting right. it go. There's so much working against this, John. I agree with everything you're saying. There's just so much. I, I just, what, what's, what I struggle with is how many people live the opposite. And so why wouldn't this be the normal way of thinking? Why does this have to be, hey, by the way, uh, there's a different way to look at this. Why can't this be the normal way of looking at it? Right. You know, right. I, mean, you, you've, I mean, obviously, you know, Buddhism and meditation, it's been around forever. And, I, and, and, and millions of people subscribe to it. I just don't see it as the norm here in the United States. Well, what's, what's really interesting, and, and uh, you know, I speak for lots of corporations, and what I have noticed over the past 10 years is a huge shift yeah. in that direction. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> one of the big things about, about eight years ago, there was a big shift in corporations towards values-based. Yeah. You know, and everybody wanted to have the family values and, and get to this positive experience. Um, I noticed a lot of corporations are now bringing in yoga instructors yeah. and they're doing breathing techniques and yoga and yoga work. Right. Um, when I, I, since, since January, I've been on 115 podcasts. And I mean, that's, that's, that's doing okay. something right there. Right. A lot of them were leadership and professional development podcasts. Yeah. There was not one podcast where we didn't get, we didn't talk about some sort of spiritual aspect. Not, I mean, not one, not, not one. And it was nine times out of 10, it wasn't even me who brought it up. Yeah. Right. It was them who they, they had brought it up. So I believe that we're heading in that direction. I also believe that the more we, you know, the internet has been great because there's all of that research is right at our fingertips. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think the more people find that interest, they're doing their Google, Google searches and they're finding that this more and more information. Yeah. Right. And that I see a major shift in that direction. And, but the, the thing is that most people won't break out of their, and I, I say most, I would say half the people in the world don't, won't break out of their, their trained responses, their habits, you know? And for instance, if your parents, if your grandparents lived through the depression, yeah. your parents probably have a lack mentality. Yeah. And yeah. so they're handing that lack mentality down to their kids as well. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, you know, you can struggle for money your whole life or you can get into a prosperity mentality and change your experience. Right. And it literally does come down to mindset in, in every aspect of your life. You know, we have we have multiple pillars of our life, you know, uh, mind, body, career, uh, relationships uh, and, and, and finances. I, I, I separate career and finances because they are two different things. Yeah. Um, and. When you look at it from from that that aspect every every one of us has to has to find our way and i find that most people because of their past experiences aren't willing to give themselves a break yeah. you know they will say worse things about themselves than they, they would allow anybody to say something about their friends right and it's all because of that subconscious belief you know you have to come to a point where you really like who you are and forgive yourself you know, it's, it's funny, you know, I, I, I've been putting up vi daily videos for years. You know, I, I have hundreds and hundreds of videos online. And the three that are the number one videos that I have have the word conscience in, in the title. People get into this, this idea that they've done something bad yeah. and they're a bad person. So whatever you're saying about this present moment is what you're becoming and what you're creating. And so if you're constantly creating and the fact that I did something wrong in the past, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a 
something weighing heavy on your conscience, right. go back and do your best to make amends for it. Yeah. They may never forgive you, yeah. but you have to forgive yourself, right? right. That, that's the key. Right. That's, right. You, can, you cannot control what other people do and think. It's, it's how do you choose to respond to it and live through it now, right? Right, exactly. And so these people, get, they get so trapped in the fact that they're a, a bad person, right? I, I am, God's name, a bad person. So now they're creating the fact that they're a bad person in their experience. You know, when I, when I was going through my back stuff, there were certain words I took out of my vocabulary and those words were wanting, needing, hoping, and trying. And the reason I took them out of them because none of them were present moment active. And, you know, I said, I am creating, I'm enjoying, I am a stunt man. I am a fight director. When I moved here, I, it was very, very interesting because I didn't move here because I wanted to move here. I moved here because my wife and I split. She moved to Ohio with my son. And I was, there was no way that I was going to be away from my son. So I live within a few miles of her and my son. Sure. So I moved to, moved to here and I was like, okay, so while I'm here, I need to figure out, you know, I was still speaking and I was still doing fight my show at that point. And I was like, I'd like to find something, something steady and local here too. So I, I literally said, I, I, well, I'm, I'm going to teach college. And I just started, you know, my, my background was in architecture and fight direction. The next fight choreography job I got was at a local theater in Cleveland. And they were doing My Favorite Year, which is a great play. And the guy who was playing, the, there were several sword fights that I had to chore- choreograph. And the guy playing the lead was an extremely talented guy, very, very good actor. And I came in, I did the whole thing. And we finished the whole thing. And he says, John, he says, uh, I've never seen a fight director like you. They're the best fight director I've ever seen. You know, Have you ever thought about maybe teaching a master class somewhere? Wow. And I was like, yeah, you know, he says, yeah, just a one-time master class. I said, okay, yeah, so he says, I'm the dean of theater for Oberlin College. Why don't you come teach a master class? So I go out and I teach a one, one-time, one-off master class. And we finish the master class. And he says, I, I wanted to do the master class so I could see how you teach. How'd you like a semester? That's and, I taught there, and I taught there for eight years. It's unbelievable. Like, it, it, to me, it comes back to your dad, you know, that your dad gave <clears> that gift you know, the fact that the relationship might have been strained actually caused you to develop a set of skills and interests that have woven into your entire life, which is, that, that's the theme I'm hearing as you're talking. And I know it's yeah. not the five Fs, but had, oh, you, had, had you not done that, would you be able to do all this stuff? It's, it's pretty, it's very cool. Right. Well, well, out, out of that, that came the five Fs. So, I mean, yeah. it's all part of the, part of the, for me, the five Fs is just a, just a, a process, but absolutely 100%. This theme through my life of fight direction and, and all that has been has been prevalent and has been the 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 um, the thread that led me to that next uh, discovery. Yeah. And that dis- those discoveries that I made, you know, when, when Bruce Lee wrote his book, he was lying in a hospital bed in traction. And he was told he would never do martial arts again. And he wrote a book instead, right? So unbelievable. So even when he was lying in that hospital bed. He was still thinking martial arts yep. and that was his focus. So for me now, my, the way my life has shifted now, for me, my, my, um, my purpose in life has shifted quite a bit because, and it's something that you've already kind of t- touched on is this idea that how do, how do we get people to start living this way? Well, the only way people start living this way is to experience it. And the only way people who can experience it is to be exposed to it. And so they have to see it happening and see. So what I do now is, is a life purpose. It's like, I, I'm going out there and I'm showing them what they're capable of, what they can do and how they can break out of those limiting beliefs. And so to me, it, it's, it's a total driving force. It's why I do what I do now. Right. And I still do fight direction. I still, there's a local theater right down the hill from my house here. I, I, I direct their Shakespeare plays and I do all their fights and, you know, I still do that stuff because it's fun to do. That's but, but but the purpose is to now break people out of their limiting beliefs and put them on a new path. What's the best way for people to get in touch with you, John? Easiest way to get a hold of me, corporateactionhero.com. And on there, you're going to find LinkedIn and Twitter and all this stuff. But before we go, I do want to make sure I share with your audience. I'm going to give them a free gift. Uh-huh. And it's it's my 5F workbook. Um, and you'll have to go to the, to, to the link to get it. It's www.corporateactionhero.com slash gift um and now what this is it's a 5f workbook now it's a free gift when i say free i mean free 
There's nothing on that page that'll sell you a thing. And you don't even have to leave an email address. It literally is a place to go and get the book. This book will, will help you figure out your way through some of those limiting beliefs that you have and put you on a path to creating successful present moments. Excellent. I'll leave it at that. that I really enjoyed this conversation, John. Thanks for being with me today. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.